afternoon, everybody. Uh, Sam Sargent, Director of Strategy and Policy at Caltrain. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Caltrain is a commuter rail operation or a regional rail operation up in the Bay Area. We run on 77 miles between San Francisco and Gilroy, but we own 51 of those miles outright uh, between San Francisco and San Jose, which we consider to be our mainline territory. The remainder of that is owned by Union Pacific. We operate 31 stations in 20 cities and three counties. We are currently a diesel operation, but as we will focus on in my presentation, we are moving into an electrified future, which is incredibly, incredibly exciting. Um, you can see here our, our fleet. Um, it's, uh, it's an aging fleet, but it is it has served us very well for uh, almost 40 years. And what's really amazing to me, and I've now been with Caltrain for two years. I previously was in Austin at Capital Metro where I was working on the Project Connect program, um, is to arrive at a commuter rail operation that has been serving these communities for 30 years under the brand of Caltrain, but has been an asset for 160 years. We actually just had our 160th anniversary of that railroad uh, existing. It was a Southern Pacific asset for a long time. And yet, despite that long history, we're really like a startup in many ways. Um, we have an interesting uh, governance structure, so if you like complexity, uh, I, I recommend the way that we are set up, but we're a three-county en entity. We've, uh, we've got, and I'm, I'm certain that our friends at Metrolink and elsewhere have even more complex governance structures, but um, we're a three-county entity. We've got uh, three representatives from each of our counties, San Francisco, San Mateo, and Santa Clara County, which is where San Jose is, and then we uh, exist under SamTrans, which is our managing agency. But enough about that. Let's talk about what we have built and what we are soon to be operating. So Caltrain, for those of you who don't know, is moving to an all-electric, all-zero-emission mainline operation uh, starting in September. And this is a uh, 10, let's call it a 10-year project, but it's a dream that's been on this corridor for many more decades than that. In fact, I think when we were digging around in some historical documents, we saw the first mention of the Southern Pacific considering using this corridor as an interurban line with overhead catenary back in the teens. And so the notion of this not being coal or oil or diesel uh, has been out there for a long time. Um, so 51 miles are electrified, over 3,000 poles are in the ground. Uh, $2.44 billion uh, project. This is a massive undertaking with an enormous amount of CIG FTA dollars as well as state funds and as was mentioned by our wonderful colleagues from High Speed Rail, $713 million of this total came from them because this is an enabling work for Northern California. And so we're gonna have this up and running 25 kV ready not only for us this fall but is gonna be ready for High Speed Rail when they arrive. Um, and uh, we've got 23 of these beautiful Stadler electric train sets. These are Swiss designed, uh, but built in Salt Lake City. Uh, the last time I was at the factory in Salt Lake City, we were taking up most of the floor space, but we've got almost all of them uh, now on property, which is really exciting. We've been running uh, overnight testing every single night, because so we've got to put 1,000 miles onto each of these sets, and 51 miles or less means that you've got to run this thing back and forth quite a bit, but it's still very exciting, and our social media people love it because we get a million chances to test out drone footage at sunrise and sunset. Um, so we've got some good stuff going up on our social media if you haven't, uh, haven't followed us yet. Some of the big benefits that we, we see from electrification, as you can imagine, and many of you may be in communities that already have electrified uh, rail service or bus service, is obviously the sustainability element. Millions of tons of GHGs not being moved along our corridor. We can now really talk about our benefit beyond getting people out of single occupancy vehicles, mainly on the 101, which is what we parallel. Um, and, uh, and really being a much cleaner operation for our customers on board, cleaner, quieter, but also for the communities off board. Because that's a huge part of any of these investments, whether it's high speed rail, whether it's us, whether it's LA Metro, Metrolink, is there's always going to be more taxpayers paying for your service than are going to be on board. That's just the nature of how transit works. Doesn't mean that you're not going to move a ton of people, but you've got to make sure that you've got a product that speaks not only to the people currently on board, 
who will in the future be on board or who may never be on board, but you still want them to look at that asset and say, that was worth it, and here's why. Um, also, faster end-to-end -end service. That's enormous because I'm going to talk a little bit, not just about the technology um, in the construction project, but also about our recovery because many of you either work with or for uh, transit agencies, and many of us are at different levels of recovery, and Caltrain, frankly, is one of the most stubborn uh, recoveries out there, and I'll, I'll touch on that uh, here in a moment. Um, but Stadler Equipment, Ball for Beatty, uh, was, uh, did the design build work on this, and so when they wrap, uh, they'll be off property. Uh, Herzog is our uh, operator, uh, so we have a contracted out operation. Uh, they will take over the O&M on the OCS, but I do expect one in 2027, we will rebid the operating contract, and I also expect for there to be subs who will assist both Tazi slash Herzog um, and the future operating contractor in the future on this work. Because going from diesel to uh, 25 kV overnight, there's a lot of help that we don't, that we're gonna need, and we're gonna need it out on the field. So looking at ridership, so before I arrived at Caltrain and before the pandemic, you know, we were moving um, a, a large amount of people. I mean, we were moving 71,000 people, 104 trains per day. That's still our current schedule on weekdays over a 52 mile uh, mainline corridor. And in the first months of the pandemic, as you can imagine, being a commuter railroad in the most telework enabled affluent corridor, and not exclusively affluent, mind you, but in, a, in an affluent telework enabled corridor, ridership dropped by about 98%. And then it slowly started to trickle back, but return to work in the Bay Area, it's, it, it's a tricky thing. It's really hard to get people back into the office. There's also layoffs. And I think right now, and this is something that we are working diligently on in our service planning for uh, our electrified schedule starting in September, is how do we expand our rider base beyond what used to be the core ridership market for us, which was a lot of tech workers going in either direction, either they lived in San Francisco and headed into Silicon Valley, or they lived in San Jose and San Mateo County and headed into the city. How can we serve folks who work at Stanford Medical Center, the children's hospital, the service industry? How can we provide more trips for off-peak, late-night customers, midday, weekends, so that we're not so wed to a nine-to-five-ish that is likely not coming back, and especially in our, our corridor? Um, so ridership uh, recovery has been, has been slow. You can see some of the trends here in the Bay Area, and I know the text is a little small, but Caltrain's there at the bottom of this. And so 34% of ridership recovery over pre-pandemic is not good. And we also were very heavily reliant on fare box recovery, which makes us even trickier. Thankfully, the three counties in our service area approved a sales tax in November 2020 that saved the railroad and has made up for some of that loss but we've got to get our ridership back um, in order to provide the level of electrified service that we are planning on providing. Um, and you can see some of these other operators that are doing better than us. One of the most common factors is that they have a ridership base that may be more students, it may be more seniors, it may be more low income folks, or in the case of San Francisco, it's a lot of local bus service working in an extremely dense environment. And so commuter railroads across the country are struggling probably more than other modes with recovery, but I think Caltrain is, is still an outlier, unfortunately. But my hope is that if we can solve this issue in a fairly stubborn, <laughs> stubborn uh, ridership environment, then hopefully we've got some examples that we can share with the rest of the industry. We had previously assumed that we were gonna be well over 100,000 folks probably today had the pandemic not occurred. Although I, I think that you could probably still see a universe where without the pandemic, people were going to begin, because of technology, they were gonna begin teleworking anyway. So, you know, I think that we were hopeful that we would be getting in that direction, but I still think we probably would have had to have addressed this either way. Um, we are expecting to see a nice bump in ridership with electrification. Hopefully it's not just people who are interested in hopping on these beautiful trains, but hopefully they hop on board, realize how nice the customer experience is, and they stay on board. Our, our operating revenues, as I mentioned, they used to be extremely dependent on fares, probably higher than almost any other operation in the United States, um, maybe with the exception of a couple of East Coast operators. 
and thankfully Measure RR was passed and we're able to continue, but we, like a number of other Bay Area agencies, are, are staring down a, a fiscal cliff. I don't really like that phrase, but we're staring down an operating deficit uh, in the near future, which is why this ridership recovery is so critical. And you can see that here. And this is something that we're working on with our regional partners, with state partners. There is a uh, SB 1031 is a state uh, measure that's Bay Area focused that would hopefully provide new operating dollars so that we can continue on without any service cuts. Um, and then there's just a lot more to that in our growth strategy. So how do we partner with folks so that we've got fair products that speak to a greater number of people? We've got fantastic ridership on Giants game days, for instance. How do we keep that buzz going for other types of trips, not just for, for the Giants or the Warriors or the Sharks? Um, how do we continue to work with uh, businesses, cities, residential communities so that we can get more passes into the hands of folks so that they are riding our service at no cost to them? Somebody else is picking up the tab. That long worked for us through our GoPass program. A lot of those tech companies paid a lot of money up front and their money, their check cleared, regardless of whether or not their, their employees were riding, but the employees had the benefit of, well, if I wanna take the train, it's not a problem. We're always working to improve the atmosphere. I think we've got a great uh, group of staff on board. We are working to improve the at station experience. We're working on some of those factors that make transit successful that we don't have in our control, like land use. So partnering with our cities to build up the density in and around our midline stations and build more transit-oriented communities. And then how do we activate through other creative ways? There are just a lot of ways to get families and whoever it might be on board and around our train and saying, you know what, I took it that one day and, and maybe I'll take it again. And in the aggregate, we can build up our, our relevancy in our ridership in our revenue. And again, just partnerships that matter a lot. If you are, are working for an agency, working with an agency, I know a lot of you may be working on the engineering component of this, but it's still really important, I think, to put yourself in the shoes of the agency folks who are trying to make this product as tempting as humanly possible for people who are still generally at home or in their cars if they have the option. Um, and I, I touched on probably a lot of these, both just branding, fair products, electrification in and of itself, um, and uh, an idea that we've got called Destination Caltrain, because honestly, a lot of folks who were commuters, they hopped on, they knew exactly what point A and point B were going to be, but now people have a point C. People, you probably heard the phrase of a third place. That's, a, that's kind of a mystery that folks in transit are trying to really uncover, which is for the longest time, we knew where people worked, we knew where major activity centers were, we generally might know where they live based on when they were boarding in the morning, but what is that third place? For a person who's working remotely, it might be a coffee shop, it might be a, a gym, it might be who knows where it is, but how can we try to plan better service around that? I think it's beyond exciting to be at Caltrain in this moment in time. Um, you know, when I've gone out to the Stadler factory and seen these machines being built and seeing them tested, seeing them tested out at Pueblo, but also on our alignment, it's really exciting. And I think regardless of where you are in this business, it's one of those things that when you're standing around it up close, whether you're at a tunnel, you're at a high-speed rail viaduct, you're standing next to one of these machines, you think, wow, if I had told myself that I was going to be doing this and getting paid for it when I was 10 years old, I'd be really proud of myself that I'd pulled this off. Um, and so it's, it's really special equipment. And I do think the onboard experience is going to be fantastic. Real-time uh, screens that many other places have. We don't have them today. Plugs, Wi-Fi, the, the works there. A lot of different seating configurations. A lot of bike storage because we are still one of the largest transit slash cycling connections in the United States. If any of you have ridden on a Washington State Ferry, you've probably seen the sea of bikes that come out of the front of those vehicle, of those vessels. Um, we, we have a similar situation here. So we usually have two bike cars on board each train where the lower level is just bike storage. Um, and then you can see some of them that are now parked in San Jose. And uh, we hope that some of you who may have the opportunity to uh, come down to San Jose for the California Transit Association meeting uh, in October, November, I believe it is, uh, as well as next year's after rail 
you'll have the chance to experience these up, up close. So our first day of operation will be on September 28th, and uh, we, we could not be more excited, and we are grateful for all the partners we've had in this. If you've got any more um, questions about um, where the project is heading, um, there is a, a, a site uh, on our page, a, a subpage for caltrain.com slash electrification. That'll have some of the latest on the project development. We also have our procurement portal there, so you can keep an eye out for opportunities. Um, and I believe that my contact information is not there, um, but it's sergeant, S-A-R-G-E-N-T-S, -E at caltrain.com. Uh, so if you ever have any questions or you find yourself up in the Bay Area, please do visit. We're really proud of what we pulled off, and uh, thank you for having us. Thank you.